Good morning. Uh, who can tell me what this is? Pardon? Rabbit's head, no, not a rabbit. Anyone? Cat is closer, but no. Is it a skull? It is a skull, but that's not the answer I'm looking for. Okay, look at the power. Look how solid, how robust this is. So someone said, dog is even closer. Um, it is actually a badger. Uh, yeah, Aaron's right. But nobody said what I was hoping they would say. It's very disappointing. I was hoping someone was going to say wolf. So you did. Okay. It's not a wolf skull. It looks similar to a wolf skull because they're quite closely related. But there's something else that looks much more similar to a wolf skull. And that's the skull of an animal called a thylacine. I don't know how many of you have even heard of that. It's uh, an Australian mammal that went extinct about 100 years ago. And it's sometimes called the marsupial wolf. Uh, and the reason is it so closely resembles a wolf. Uh, and it's the skulls in particular are so similar that even trained anatomists and zoologists can be fooled if they're looking at the skull of a marsupial wolf into thinking that they're seeing the skull of an actual wolf. And yet, the animals are not at all closely related. They're wildly different. The marsupial wolf is more closely related to kangaroos and koalas than it is to a, a true wolf. And the true wolf is more closely related to mice and elephants um, and whales than it is to a marsupial wolf. So it's very misleading. Two very, very different things. They look so similar. And we often find this. And if we're not paying attention, we can kind of fall for the trick and look at one thing and think we're seeing something different. Here's a much more serious example of the same thing happening. Right, consider two Christians. Uh, we'll call them Amy and Ben, just for convenience, uh, A and B. Uh, both of them go to church pretty much every week. Both of them are actively participating in their home groups in the middle of the week. Both of them volunteer at church. Uh, maybe one of them helps with the kids' work and one with the worship. So if you look at the surface of these two Christians, you would think that their spiritual lives are very similar. You would think that they're living the same kind of way. But actually, my fictional two people that I've invented have very, very different things going on. They're both working hard, but Amy is working hard because she's trying to earn God's love. And she is trying to put in the effort and put in the hours and be at the meetings and make the contribution to earn the love of God. Uh, and Ben, having had better teaching, knows that God loves him, not because of his own achievements, but just because God is love, and that's what God is like. And in response to that, Ben is working just as hard as Amy, but his motivation is completely different. Uh, do you remember Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 writes, by the grace of God, I worked harder than all the other apostles, yet not I, but the grace of God that is within me. Now, he's not at all saying that because of the grace of God, because I know God loves me, I can just lie back and relax. That nothing could be further from the way that Paul lived his life. And yet his hard work, like that of Ben in this story, is based on it as a response to God's love. Whereas Amy seems to be doing all the same things, her life looks very similar, but what's going on in fact is she's doing a very unhealthy thing, which is trying to earn the love of the God who has already chosen to love her. So you see what I'm talking about here. They look the same, they're not the same. And the topic we want to look at today is how we ask God for things and receive those things. Uh, and the problem here is there are two things we can do that look very similar but in their heart, they're very different. Uh, and they're kind of captured by that verse in 1 Timothy uh, that Jonathan read out earlier. You remember that um, Timothy was a leader of a church, so the people Paul was writing about, they were both Christians, they would both have been church members, and both of them uh, seem to be living in ways where they're confident that they're going to have everything that they need. They look very similar on the outside, but their hearts are very different. Because first of all, Paul talks about those who are rich in this present world and the result is that they become arrogant because they put their hope in the wealth. 
And then he talks about those who put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Now you can see both of them are confident. Both of them are going through life in a way where they're not worrying about money, but for very, very different reasons. If you're not paying attention, they look similar. If you are, they're very different. So there's no getting away from the fact that the New Testament invites us over and over again to to think clearly about things, to have discernment, to to develop wisdom, so that we don't fall for these kinds of things, so that we see below the surface. Uh, Jesus himself, you remember, tells us to be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. Uh, Three examples from the writing of Paul. Uh, In Ephesians, he says, walk as children of light and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Uh, In Romans, very famous verse, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? So that you may discern what is the will of God, what's good and acceptable and perfect. Uh, And in Philippians, it's my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent. So it's really important that we uh, not just blunder blindly through our Christian lives. It's not, it's not enough just that we be enthusiastic. We need to understand what's going on as well. And the really good news is wisdom is one of the few things in the Bible that we're explicitly promised if we ask for it, God will give it. Uh, here we are in James's letter, chapter 1, verse 5. This couldn't be clearer, really. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. So we're not talking here about academic intelligence. We're not talking about uh, any of the exam results or anything like that. We're talking about uh, a shrewdness and insight to understand the things that we're looking at. So these two things that we're going to look at today that look superficially similar and are completely different are two ways of asking God for things and receiving things. Uh, And we've already seen a hint of them, I guess, in in those two people mentioned in the verse in Timothy. So the first one that we're going to look at is this this thing that's called the prosperity gospel or prosperity teaching. Uh, Probably you've all come across it in some form or other. Sometimes it's laid right out in front of you. Sometimes bits of it just creep into other things. Uh, Wikipedia describes it as a religious belief that financial blessing and physical well-being are always the will of God for them, and that faith and positive speech and donations to religious causes will increase one's material wealth. Now, I like how clearly the Wikipedia article lays that out. As soon as you hear it described that way, you can immediately say, well, that's a heretical misunderstanding of what the Bible teaches. But of course, it's often much more insidious, and you won't have the whole thing laid out. You won't have someone turning up on YouTube and saying, today I'm going to preach a prosperity gospel. But you may hear someone who otherwise you you respect their teaching just slip into this way of thinking in what they bring you. So again, you know, we need to keep our smarts. We need to have that wisdom that God gives. So where does this idea come from? Well, it's from misinterpreting verses like this one uh, in the... Jesus' words, give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. Now, a naive Christian can seize on give, and it will be given to you, as though that's talking about a kind of a contract or a transaction, as though the deal is if we give God a thing, he's then obliged to give us more of that thing. And that's the origin of this kind of teaching. But as so often in the Bible, you just need to read the verses around that one and you can immediately see what's actually going on and how it's being misread. So in the context, in Luke 6, this, everything Jesus is talking about is the way that we treat other people. So it's part of the same block of teaching where he says, don't judge other people and you won't be judged. And where he says, don't condemn and you won't be condemned. Where he says, forgive and you will be forgiven. So that's the context of this saying, Um, give and it will be given to you. He's talking about a whole dynamic of the way that we behave towards other people and how God behaves towards us. So it's not talking about money. It's not talking about uh, a secret to wealth. And if you ever come across sort of Christian teaching saying here's the one secret to wealth and it's based on this, then you're being misled. 
So just read around it. And this is a good rule for anything. Yeah. If you read it, any Christian teaching that strikes you as, oh, is that really right? Nearly always the thing to do is just go back to the verse that they quoted, read a few verses before, a few verses after, see what point is being made. So, given that it's kind of easy to see that this approach to uh, prosperity, to that kind of teaching, it's not hard to see that it's wrong. Why is it attractive, I wonder? I think we can learn some things about ourselves here. One reason, I think, is that it's a comforting message for Christians who have a lot of money, that they can tell themselves that it's because God has blessed them and because it's God is pleased with them. Uh, and that can even have the, the really poisonous effect, I think, of making rich Christians think, well, I should hang on to this money that God's given me and not give it to other people. But I don't think that works as an explanation for how prosperity teaching has become so widespread in some areas because it also suckers in a lot of poor people. And in fact, I think it's the reason that some of those poor people are poor because they go for this idea that if they just give what they've got, then God is obliged to give back to them. So there are other things going on as well. And I think there are a couple of psychological reasons why this sort of teaching can draw people in. One of them, I think, is pride. You know that there's a part of us that, that wants to be in a transaction with God, as though we're dealing with him as equals. So I think every Christian understands that we're saved by God's grace. But it's very easy to, to say, Fiona gave me this expression, that we just go, I'll take it from here. Like, as though we say to God, thanks for the free gift of salvation. From here on, I'm going to pay my way. You know, because we want to feel like we've earned something. We want to feel like we're worth it. And Paul addresses this directly in Galatians in his usual uncompromising way. Are you so stupid, he asks in chapter 3 and verse 3. Stupid is a Bible word. Are you so stupid after beginning by means of the Spirit? Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? In other words, what God has begun by his goodness to you, are you now trying to continue by your own human effort? And earlier in the same, same passage, he just caught, addresses them by saying, you stupid Galatians. And I always feel like that's such a good insult. So our pride, I think, is part of the reason that we can, even if we know better, we can get drawn into this transactional way of thinking in how we deal with God. Uh, and the other reason, I think, is that we all have a desire to be in control. Um, and in many ways, it's a very healthy thing. You know, it's right that we should aim to be in control of our careers and of what work we do. It's right that we should aim to control our household finances. And there are lots of things that it's right that we should control as part of being an adult. But as soon as we start to slip across that and think that we want to be in control of our relationship with God, we've completely misunderstood the nature of things. So I can understand why it's tempting to think if I do a certain thing for God, then by some divine equation, he's obliged to do this other thing for me. But it's so completely mistaken. And the best way to see how it's mistaken is to go back to the, the, the biblical metaphor that we see over and over again of us as being God's children. Now, if you imagine a young child... Uh, it's right that that child should have control over certain things, like how they play with their toys. So if you give a kid some wooden blocks and you're thinking they should be making a tower out of these and instead the kid decides, no, what I want to do is make a, a straight line and, and drive a car along the top of them, that's good. The child should be in control of how he or she plays with those blocks. But if the child then generalizes and thinks that he should be in charge of his parents then he's fundamentally misunderstood the relationship because the parents are the source of all the good things and the parents have the wisdom, the parents have the understanding of what needs to be done. The child cannot control the parents and even if the child could control the parents, it would certainly not be good for that child. You know, I remember when I was a kid, I would have just eaten nothing but chocolate if I'd had my way. In fact, I wouldn't mind that now still. Um. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So children will not make wise decisions for themselves uh, because they're children and they don't know anything. But they stand in the same relation to their parents 
as we stand in relation to God. And in just the same way, if we think we can make decisions for ourselves, and if we were able to control God so he had to do things our way, that would not work out well for us. It's not just that he's more powerful than us and can't be manipulated, it's that he's wiser than us and shouldn't be manipulated. So those, I think, are are the reasons why this approach to trying to control how God deals with us are so appealing. So to summarize again, I think it's comforting for rich people. I think it appeals to our pride, and I think it appeals to our sense of wanting to be in control. So you may be asking, okay, if it's such a good fit for our nature, why does it really matter if, uh, if people bring this, this incorrect way of understanding how we relate to God? Uh, here's what Paul says about whether it matters. Back in Galatians, if even we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preached to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say it again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Gosh, those are hard, hard words. He is not holding back. And what was the gospel they accepted? It was the gospel of grace. It was the gospel that God's goodness was the source and the beginning of everything important in the physical universe and in their lives, and that the source of our ongoing lives now. And the alternative gospel he's talking about is the one that we can take control for ourselves, and that it's down to us. Now, when Paul is that harsh on something, I think we can learn from that and go with it. It's important, why? Because it takes the focus away from where it belongs, which is the goodness of God, and fixes that focus on a lie, which is the idea that we're in control and that God is in any way subject to us. So in a moment, I'm going to switch to talking about um, what the right way to think is, about asking God for things and receiving them. Before I do, I just want to tell you a story I heard about a, a Christian conference happening somewhere in Southeast Asia, I I can't remember if it was Thailand or South Korea, and they'd invited a big-name American preacher to come and do the talk, and they were doing simultaneous translation from English into the local language. And they they found to their horror, as this big name started talking, that he was bringing this false gospel of prosperity. And so what do you do in that situation? They could have stopped him and brought it screeching to a halt and had a whole big scene. Or even worse, I think, they could have just kept quiet and let him finish and deal with it afterwards. They did, I think, a really smart thing. They just mistranslated his talk. So he was saying these heretical things here. And the Southeast Asian translators were saying the reality. They were telling people the reality of what God is like and how he gives to us. So I I like that. And I hope nobody needs to dub over the recording of this. Okay. So, how do we ask God for things? How do we receive them? How do we expect him to give us these things without falling into the trap of this kind of prosperity idea where we feel like we're in control of God? Because, you know, every heresy starts out as a distorted version of something true. And the thing that's true here is that we should ask God for things and we should expect them. Uh, Jesus taught us exactly that. Here we are in the Sermon on the Mount, very familiar words. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened to him. So, was I wrong in the first half of this message? Are we being told, ask God for things, and he's obliged to give them to us? No, I was right all along. Um, And as always, the way you can tell is by reading around that proof text and seeing what else it says. So here's the very next thing Jesus says. He explains why we should ask and expect to receive. He says this. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a snake? And if you then, though you are evil, note how tactful Jesus is, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? 
So what's this about? What's the fundamental thing going on? It's that God is good. We're not, Jesus in telling us to ask and we'll receive isn't giving us a formula. He's not giving us an equation. He's not laying out a contract. He's saying, look how good God is. He's saying God answers when we need things. So it's not about how effective our asking is. You'll sometimes hear people talking as though the way we ask God for things is a kind of a key to making things work, or even maybe using a special form of words, or asking especially fervently, or have we put in half an hour of prayer every morning for a week to ask for a thing? That really isn't the point here. It's not what's being said. It's not Jesus saying, you've got to up your asking game, and then God will have to answer you. He's saying, look how good God is. Just ask. Do you know, I I really can't overemphasize this. When God gives something to us, it's not about our merit. It's about his. It's not about how well we ask. It's not about whether we've completed all our spiritual disciplines and done our weekly acts of evangelism. It's about him being good. I hope everyone's going to get a little bit bored of me saying this because I want to say it over and over again. It is about the goodness of God. Right, the goodness of God. By the way, it's great that all the children went quiet just at that moment. (laughs) Just at the emotional high point, it's the goodness of God. So how then do we receive from God when he gives us the things we ask? I'm going to tell you two ways that we don't do it and one way that we do. Here's one of the ways we don't receive from God, not like a customer using a vending machine. So if you use a vending machine, you put your money in, and the machine does what a machine does. It has no choice in the matter. It's just electricity flowing through circuits. The little spring coily thing turns, and the Kit Kat drops down, and you, or better still, a double-decker. Um, and that's just, it works automatically and mechanically. That is not what happens when we ask God for something, and he gives us something. Here's another thing that it isn't like. So when we ask God for something and we get it, it's not like uh, a worker getting his wages from an employee. If you go and work in an office and you, you do a month's filing and meetings and all the other stuff that you do in your office job, at the end of that, your employer gives you your salary and you've earned that salary. It, that's not a matter of grace, it's a matter of justice. It's right and proper that you do the work and you get the consequence of the work. It's just the way something fundamentally works. Even if the employer is, is not a kind person, even if the employer dislikes you personally, you're in a contract. You do the work, you get the money. That's not what it's like when we ask God for things. He doesn't look at the quality of our work and check that we've done the things we ought to have got done during the, the month and met our objectives. Here's what it is like, and it's an unsurprising simile because it's the one we all know. It's like a child receiving from a parent. Now, when our boys asked us for something when they were young, we didn't assess how good their behavior had been that day. We didn't think, uh, we're not going to give you your tea tonight because you threw a tantrum earlier. Well, except in extreme circumstances, but in general... You know, that's not how we run things. It's not how any parent runs things. And we certainly wouldn't say uh, no food for the next month or because, because of your bad behavior. Why do parents give things to their children? It's because they love them. And it's really straightforward, isn't it? It's be, because we love them. So why does God give things to us? Because he loves us. I mean, it's so simple. It's really simple. And that's why it can be a bit of an offense to our pride, I think, to go back to something I touched on earlier. We kind of want to feel that we're growing up. You know, we're not like children anymore. We're becoming adults and we can can pay our own way. No, we can't. God gives us stuff because he loves us. We exist because he loves us. We breathe moment by moment because he loves us. And we'd just be so much happier and so much more content when we get that into our heads and lose the idea that we kind of graduate out of that into some other way of relating to him. So, again, I want to emphasize this. If we ask God for things and we expect him to give them to us, that looks, superficially, it looks very much like 
the prosperity teaching, doesn't it? It's fundamentally different, but it looks similar. It's as different as a marsupial wolf skull is from a, a real wolf. Although they, they look so similar, they really are not. We're not trying to manipulate God. We're not like someone trying to cast a magic spell by knowing the exact right words that we need to say and asking. We're not trying to extract payment from God as though he owes us because of what, his, what we've done for him and what we've given him. All we're doing is receiving what he freely gives. And what we, what we can take away from this, I think, is that it's perfectly reasonable that we love the gifts that God gives us. Um, I could talk for ages about the glory of food, for example. I, I'm so glad that I'm not a plant, that I don't photosynthesize. I, the way I feed my body is by ingesting delicious things. And that's a gift of God. You know, it didn't have to be that way. It could have been that the eating is just mechanical. But so that's just one of many examples, which I, uh, I had a whole second half of this sermon, which you'll be glad to know you're not going to get today. But I'll, I'll save it for another occasion that goes into this in much more detail. But his gifts are good. But what I want to draw attention to is this. The giver is better still. So yes, love the gifts. uh, But they should not be something that we focus on instead of the giver. Instead, God's gift should be a lens through which we see the giver. So that every time I eat a mouthful of delicious pizza with a, a crust that's inflated and it's a little bit crunchy but a little soft and it has that kind of slightly biting tanginess to tomato sauce and just a hint of meatiness from the pepperoni. Each mouthful of that is not just delicious food, it's also a tiny, tiny glimpse of the goodness of God. And it's so good as we develop the ability just to see him through those things. So, the reason pizza is so good is because God loves us. And that is a reason for us to love him. For our love to him to grow and to develop. And the same goes... Sorry? There are other foods. I mean, I wonder what it's talk about. Sushi, obviously, s- s- steak is a big one. What about the complexity of Thai curries? There's so much going on. <laughs> uh, and even really straightforward food, like a, a good, good new potato. That can be so magical. But rather than let the end of this message just devolve into a list of foods... <laughs> which I could also do a whole session on. I want to just say this. Remember Amy and Ben from the beginning. Their lives look similar. But what's going on underneath is so different. You can imagine both of them asking God for something and receiving it. And Amy, because of the way her relationship with God has, has been poisoned by this idea of earning things, she'll be thinking, I've done my bit for God. Now he's got to give me what I've earned. But Ben is thinking... God is good and he loves me. And I'm trusting him to give me what I need. Amy's life is going to be hard work. It's going to be stressful. Even while she's doing the same things as Ben, she's not going to be enjoying them. She's going to be worried about, is this good enough? Am I doing enough? Is God pleased with me? Ben knows that God is pleased with him and he's doing those things because he knows that already. So yeah, we we, we want to ask God for the things that we need. And we absolutely should trust him to meet our needs. But doing that should be restful for us. It shouldn't be just another kind of work where we try and figure out how to ask. So, Mike, what's the application of this? Now, often my preaching is criticized for not including an application. Sometimes that's a legitimate criticism. For messages like this one, I think it's absolutely right that there isn't one. So sometimes someone talking about asking and receiving from God will end up with, so here's the technique, here's what you say, here's how you do it. But the whole point is there is no technique. Why? Because we're not trusting a mechanism, we're trusting a person. We're trusting a person who loves us, who chose us before the foundation of the world, for those of you who remember the first in the Ephesians 1 series, and who loves us today and who holds our present and our future in the palm of his hand. That's who we're trusting, and that's why we can ask God for things and hope to receive them.